Let's do this. Um, so who actually has been to any of our virtual events before? Oh, your hand. All right, so for the rest of you who never participate in any of our events, um, Founders Hong Kong, we've been running like virtual events for the, since 2019. This is our, actually, we only done physical events maybe two or three times since for the past three years we've been basically quarantined. So I'm so excited that you know, today we get the chance to thank you for our hosts, um, Chris and Amy for organizing and having us here. Um, but the mission is really about connecting Hong Kong founders with the rest of the world, particular focus on investment and actually growth. So going forward, uh, the next one very likely will be um, doing a Hong Kong Internet Report. And for the rest of the year, every single month, we'll invite more successful entrepreneurs, investors to continue to support us. So with that said, uh, for those of you who are not on our mailing list, please join. Uh, one particular effort that we're trying to do as we speak is to get everyone to fill out the survey for Hong Kong ecosystem. The result is going to be part of the Hong Kong Internet Report, so we really, really need your support, and hopefully we'll get all the results in by the end of this month. So with that said, I'm going to invite my two awesome partners and friends, um, Dr. Kat Lee, and come on up, and then also um, my partners uh, at Race Capital, Alfred Chong. So. So the Fed increased interest rates five times. Uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Holmes now in jail. And uh, the stock market dropped at least 50, I don't know, 80% in terms of the many, many other tech stock, stock price. So, do you, so my first question is going to be around, what do you guys, any prediction for 2023? Is it going to be better, worse? Any prediction just for venture and tech in general? Um, maybe we'll start with Alfred and then Kathy. Well, welcome everybody. So good to see you all. Um, every day is a good day to be in Hong Kong. I'm so glad to be back and um, to be on stage with uh, Kai Fu Lao Su. That's, um, actually, it's my first time to be on stage with uh, Kai Fu. It's, it's uh, wonderful to be here. Um, I think one of the things we should expect, th th there's a reason why interest rates went up five times. I think four of those times were 75 basis points, which is extremely aggressive. And um, is to try to cool asset prices and also look at uh, employment rates. So if you look in the US economy, it, it's working okay, but not great. So I, I, you know, I don't know what will, you guys on here? So what I was just saying is, um, despite the five different interest rates, I, asset price has come a little bit, but the employment rate in the US is still really strong. So I would not be surprised that more interest rate hike may be coming. And that obviously will affect the equity market. Alongside with that would be late stage evaluation, which has come down a lot, but still expensive comparing to the uh, public companies. So in order for, I think, this tide of shift, likely what we will see in 23 is at least in the first half is going to be, I'm going to guess it's going to be pretty tough. And we start to see uh, prices of deals coming down from late all the way down to early. And actually, Edom and I actually saw a company yesterday, for the first time we've seen um, seed stage company drop below $10 million post money valuation. So that was pretty shocking. So I think um, th this is nothing that we haven't seen before. I will compare this to Kind of the year 2000 was very similar because in the year 2000 we saw a large equity bubble in tech bursted and we saw consolidation and in 2001 we saw some kind of 11 happen which is kind of similar to what you know we've seen in the macro environment with the ukraine war and all that so um then we saw a huge amount of innovation from that point on all the way through consolidations and different things and see and we saw the maturation of the internet. So we should probably see something very similar of this kind of things to happen as well. From that perspective, I'm actually quite optimistic of tech going forward in 2030. Okay, so first let me comment on US. Uh, I know much less about my two colleagues here, but our my view is three very unusual things happened in the last couple of years. One is the issuance of a huge amount of money. 
and that resulted in trillions of dollars, much more than is needed or appropriate due to a whole set of reasons. And that money has led to overvaluation because when people who don't need the subsidy get the subsidy, what are they going to do? Buy stocks, right? Or the larger um, beneficiaries, they'll invest in VCs and PEs. As a result, the, uh, the total amount of money raised in Silicon Valley was dramatically higher uh, during the COVID years. And, and that has further led to uh, overvalue, uh, bubble valuations, uh, which has to uh, eventually be corrected. Uh, when I visited Silicon Valley recently, I saw many companies sitting on a lot of cash because they raised money when the stock, when the price was really high, and now they, their value is just not there. And VCs that have uh, very good on paper IRR are faced with the problem of how to deal with companies in their portfolio that are much, much too high. Uh, the second reason I think is a perception, a perception that technology does not deliver the growth that people thought it would uh, post-COVID. That is, in the beginning of COVID, companies like Zoom, DocuSign, and others have really shown amazing growth. And it's believed that Peloton and other companies will, con will, will continue that uh, throughout COVID and even beyond COVID. And as COVID sort of ended in the U.S., and, uh, in US uh, that growth came down dramatically. And then now it looks like uh, really the, the hyper growth is, com is coming down to the old reality. So therefore the valuations are going to come down. So this happens uh, in the first of the stock and it trickles back as Alfred says. And the third phenomenon is that uh, the, I think in the investment community in, uh, community in general uh, always lets the pendulum swing too hard. So when things look good, the price get way overvalued. And when things don't look good, they get way undervalued. And we're currently on that swing, perhaps um, towards, but not quite at the bottom yet. That's my view on the US, may not be completely accurate, uh, take it with a grain of salt. My view on China is that China began uh, the descent of its um, tech valuation well before the US, due to a different set of reasons. Some industries were facing trouble, antitrust issues, and um, <clears throat> uh, uncertainties later due to uh, different policies uh, regarding uh, all kinds of things. So those, those kind of created a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt in the investor's eyes. So China stock and China growth, PE, and then trickling down to early stage really happened some nine months before the US. So in some sense, China is a little bit of a leading indicator for the US at a, at a macro sense, because now we're seeing China uh, we're still seeing PE and growth in a lot of challenges uh, because I think um, a lot of money went in when the price was too high and also the exit become is very difficult and also uh, we say Daogua in Chinese which means your price is high in the PE but lower, the equivalent company that's public is lower, well who's going to invest in PE then? So I think that difficulty will probably continue because as long as this uh, mismatch exists between primary and secondary market. Uh, however, in China, we have for some time, uh, in our latest fund, we have been seeing the valuation come way down in the seed, um, angel, pre-A stages already, and that's continuing. Um, and uh, I think uh, we're seeing companies that would have been valued three to four times higher, uh, one and a half to two years ago, that we saw in the last six months. But I think it's a tremendous opportunity to invest in deep tech, uh, partly because I think uh, if they're undervalued, uh, you know, early stage companies shouldn't be uh, that much sensitive to the macroeconomic conditions, but they are because of people's uh, irrational uh, thinking, and investors should take advantage of that and, and capture their early stage uh, tremendous deals that exist already in China, and according to Alfred, I think happening in the U.S., so I think it's the best time to invest in early stage, I think, in both countries. And of course, of course in China, there's also the, uh, really the China, Chinese government's need to develop uh, technological self-sufficiency. So that's another potential factor that would make early stage uh, tech companies uh, attractive. But other than that, if I were investing my own money, other than early stage tech, I think I would still be watching for the pendulum.
to see if we will if maybe go even lower before before putting a lot of money in, or also watch for uh, the situation and the growth of PB that they're properly priced, uh, whether it's because the stocks have gone up or because the uh, uh, the, the, the world's PB stage prices have come down. Um, so for just a show of hands in the audience, how many of you are founders and CEOs? Okay, how many of you are investor? All right, so now half and half. All right, so hearing all this, it sounds like the environment is, there's some very particular areas super interesting for you guys in both China and US. Just let, let's start with if I'm, if I'm a CEO, a founder, if the value is dropping, it's not really good for me as a founder, right? So, so I don't want lower valuation. I, I want to you know, maximize, um, you know, make sure that I should own enough and not give too much away. So what would be your advice for our fellow founder and CEO in the audience? Would you like to start? Uh, yeah. Uh, so we're not out of the woods. So if you're a founder CEO, uh, first and foremost is managing your cash flow. And if possible, prioritizing businesses that will deliver favorable cash flow. And deprioritizing things that will burn a lot of money, reduce your headroom head or runway, uh, those are obvious. I think you, you all know that. Um, I, I think also uh, when and if you need, need to raise money, you need to raise money. Don't worry about whether this is um, potentially a down round or a flat round or the valuation is not ideal, it's way lower than before. Well, you got to really have that war chest in order to, uh, to develop your business. So I would say uh, these, I think, are some of the key things. And you might need to let go of some of the previous um, uh, aspirations. I was talking to a company that, not even a startup, that was uh, you know once worth a hundred billion dollars, and now only worth seven billion, and and he's really making the same moves that you are. So it's not like you're a startup uh, CEO and you're faced with all this um, tough treatment. Even this hundred billion dollar company CEO facing the environment that he faces, he's cutting down you know um, product lines. Uh, withdrawing from markets that he expanded. It looks on papers like silly. You spend all this money, build it up, then you kill it. But these are the practical realities one, one needs to, to have. Um, and I think we really don't, can't, I, at least I cannot predict when the economy will be better. And um, so unless you're in some very specific area, which is very hot and such areas do exist, then I would still advise in uh, exercising caution. Hmm. Alfred, you're an early investor in Slack and Databricks, and I don't want you to comment on uh, any valuation per se, but what are you going to do if this is what's going on now, particularly from founder point of view? Well, speaking from my own personal experience, um, so you guys are mostly too young to remember this, but um, uh, US had a huge stock crash in the late 1980s. And um, I remember that really well. I was working for some microsystem at the time, and I I, I didn't know what stock option was. So I got in a bunch, but I but the rest of the people were completely um, tossed off balance. And then and then um, the um, and then I ended up starting a company in the late 1994 kind of time frame. And at the time, it was really not a very good time to raise money for anything. So I ended up um, given the circumstances, I was originally from Hong Kong at the time there weren't any really a lot of Chinese founder starting a company in Silicon Valley. So I was given a term sheet to, um, for raising $50 million, which I thought would be all the money we'll ever, ever need, which is actually kind of technically true because that's the only private money that we raise. And But to give up 50% of the company, which nobody would do these days, but I thought um, it was um, given all the parameters, it was the right deal. Now, looking back, um, the company reached to you know sixty billion dollar valuation and sold for almost ten billion dollars to Oracle. Many years later, uh, I, nobody will think that was a bad deal. So I think valuation is important, but at the end of the day, it's not that important if you were able to build a great company because the exit would have been benefiting everybody. So I think that's one thing I will encourage everybody to think clearly about that. Um, all of our own portfolio company at Race Capital, you know, um, 
I encourage, but you know, sometimes we say I take out the whip and whip all the founders and say, get yourself 18 to 24 months runway. Never get yourself to be pinned against the corner that you have to go raise money because it would be very, very painful. And I, I, I generally have a tendency to be very nervous and jittery when times is good because you know how it works. Right? When times really, really good, there's only one way to go is to go down. And people panic too much when it goes the other direction. So you always have to prepare that day may come. So I think this day has now come and it is what it is. So if you don't have 18 to 24 months of runway, um, you have to find a way to get that. Cost savings. And it's always good to have great hygiene to focus on the things that's important and not do the things that's not important. There's no better time to do this now. All right, so I'm gonna quickly switch topic to AI. Um, it seems like particular Silicon Valley have a frenzy going on with particular generative AI, even though you know the deal dropped quite a bit from 18,000 to 15,000 overall. But in terms of deal count for generative AI is increasing, especially I think this couple of days, Microsoft and now they want to put 10 billion into open AI, which is valued in 29 billion. It seems like there's a lot of things happening. And plus, ChatGPT in five days, one million users, certainly impressive. So I'm gonna start with you. Um, Kaifu, what do you think about that? Um, I think on the one hand, this is an absolute um, paradigm shift. I think of the old AI that we're used to, that I wrote my books and made my first, you know, a few dozen investments on are an AI technology that's trained to do for a single domain, large amount of data uh, to optimize an objective function based on a closed loop data solution. That's how companies from TikTok all the way to computer vision, convolutional neural networks, you know, financial institutions, autonomous vehicles, that's what they're all based on. So the new approach that's being put forth, um, some people call it LLM, large language model, some call it foundation model, some simply refer to uh, instantiations like chat, chat GPT, um, DALI, um, and um, uh, stable diffusion, etc. But all of them have one thing in common, which is that uh, it's built on the premise that AI works better with more data, and more data requires more compute. And how do you have an inf nearly infinite amount of data? Well, you have to get away from the old problem of labeling because labeling is very slow, expensive, error prone, and also domain specific. So people have come up with new ways of teaching AI uh, in these giant models with the infinite amount of data without really a traditional objective function. So you can think of it as AI evolving from uh, a little autonomous unit trying to learn to do one task really well, and that's all it does. All the way now to an infinite amount of data teaching it to have a brain, to have a memory, and to have a way to analyze and abstract information and able to do some degree of generalization and intelligent behavior. And you can still take that and fine tune it with transfer learning into specific domains with objective functions. So you can have your cake and eat it too. So I think that's it's a transformative idea. Uh, which of the ideas will win now? What are the best application areas? We don't know. So the excitement behind it, I think, is completely justified. Now, there are also a number of downsides to having such systems. First is that you need a machine of maybe $100 million or buy a lot of AWS time. I think the people, our hosts here are probably laughing all the way to the bank, you know, with companies spending millions of dollars if they can't, because they can't afford a $100 million computer, well then spend a million dollars a month with AWS, right, with the GPU clusters. So those that very, very expensive. So very few companies can afford it. That means the, um, the resources will go to large companies, which might lead to platform behavior monopolistic behavior and move AI from sort of an open source, everybody can get in to one where a few people control all the resources, Microsoft, Google being the best obvious examples. So that's kind of one aspect that I'm a little concerned about is, is really not uh, offering entrepreneurs and professors a chance to participate, such as early stages of AI revolution. It's not better, it's not good or bad, it's just, a unfortunate outcome. Um, and the other one is that the power of these generative AI 
is such that they will redefine industries like search engine and um, co content creation and advertising and e-commerce and will have all the great things about AI. It'll be targeted content to persuade, uh, mesmerize, and maybe cause someone to be addicted to content and cause someone to buy a pr some product by tailoring the message to that person's needs or insecurities or desires or weaknesses. So that carries all the dangers which of what I would call Cambridge Analytica on steroids. And it will also have an amazing ability to create content, and including create misleading news, fake news, false advertising, a slander. Um, it can do that. Uh, very quickly and accurately, convincingly, and in a targeted manner. So this is one of the externalities, which I think is very difficult to deal with. Of course, researchers should work on it, but this is so much, much, much harder than everything we've heard before about the dangers of AI. We've heard about dangers in terms of privacy, in terms of security, in terms of bias, in terms of wealth inequality, job displacement, all of these, nothing compared to the potential danger of difficulty to control generative AI. For all the other externalities I can imagine, technological or social or regulatory solutions for generative AI, at least for the moment, it's hard to imagine how to control that. Um, I agree, Kai-Fu. Um, it, it's a very exciting time, there's no doubt. Um, Microsoft just invested $10 billion in um, OpenAI. So now the amount of resources that they have will lopside how things will work out, who's gonna dominate, you know, these type of remarkable data-driven kind of application. I think there are two things I think um, we should probably think about more macroly. One would be how application will work, let's say a decade from now. That's exciting stuff, right? Because if you can predict, if we could have predicted um, how the application works today and how you're using applications 10 years ago, we probably would have invested and developed things very differently than we would have done it the way to how we get there. Because um, just, I think a, a, a decade from now, we're likely instrumenting application the way that we're instrumenting like you are today. So if any of you have taken Uber to get here and you've planned to take an Uber to leave, what you will most likely do is we all rush through the elevators, down to the escalator, down to the ground floor, find a place, uh, look for an Uber, wait, instrument exactly what, where, where you're going to be picked up. All that information really is unneeded. This, these kind of applications should be fully instrumented on its own. That's automation improvement. So I would say we will likely see that happen is most of the application we use today will be fully automated. We don't have to instrument them anymore. That part of it is exciting because it obviously will be um, generating a huge amount of productivity to the workforce. And you can only imagine how it applied to the enterprises. Now it will have implications of jobs because jobs will change. Going back to um, chat GPT and generative AI, uh, I agree with you on this particular point. I remember many years ago, I went to the University of uh, California, San Francisco to look at research. Had nothing to do with software, by the way. It was stem cell technology that people were using to basically um, clone a cow. And they were very close to be able to say, uh, clone a lung clone a liver, clone a kidney. It's a very interesting thought, right? Because now I can have a spare lung, spare kidney, spare heart, spare liver, but eventually um, it was banned. This research actually was stopped for one reason, because it's not ethical. Because then obviously the world would be lopsided. People can afford to have all these spare parts, organs will live forever. And the people that can afford it will likely will have a very short life. I think, those type of issues are now coming to this particular um, point as well, because if only the price of entry is $10 billion, likelihood is what we saw, the world dominated by a few big players through the past two decades will get far worse. And that wouldn't be cool, right? So that's something that I would say, likely it will be regulated in some way it needs to be. If coal can generate coal, 
and it can run on its own, it can be very dangerous. Now, the things I'm excited about would be using generative AI, for example, into gaming, very, you know, that we really haven't seen dramatic changes for a long time. Imagine game can mutate on its own as you play along, and the character that you see can shape itself along the way. It will completely change the way that we think of gaming, entertainment, or a movie. Things that we kind of dream of, that you can traverse a path in a movie, can make your mind run for entertainment, is very exciting. But I think for businesses, for labor forces, those kind of things, we gotta be somewhat careful to be where we're embarking on. But without that, I always love to see great technology being disrupting what we've been thinking going forward. Um, so just for our entrepreneur in the room, so both of you are focusing on deep tech, tech, early stage, seed, seed, like, so what are like valuation look like and what's your average check size? Like what's your investment strategy? Um, uh, it's come down a little bit due to the environment because prices, valuations have come down um, and uh, we're able to get into companies with lower valuations. So the typical valuation nowadays would be uh, for, our, for our Series A fund, which is actually pre-ANA, um, we would be about um, uh, valuation 20 to 40 million. And then we also have an angel seed fund the valuation would be typically around 10 million. Wow. Check size is whatever, 10% of that. Def de definitely 2023 price and valuation. <laughs> you definitely don't hear that in Silicon Valley a year or two years ago. Uh, Alfred, what are you seeing? So, so raise capital, um, we almost all our investments are seed and pre-seed, infrastructure software, web two and web three. And uh, the price coming down is not new. I mean, even in the late 2022, we already see prices were coming down. We were able to own a much larger percentage than we ever had. So that part was exciting because um, the amount of effort to help a company get it off the ground, and I think some of our founders may be in this room, that we spent a huge amount of time to do a lot of work to help our founders to get things off the ground. And it's really hard to get the initial lift off. So ownership is crucial. Yeah. Valuation, evaluation, what are you seeing? Yeah, valuation is now, um, I would say in 23, likely we're gonna see for the first time, you know, for seed, pre-seed would be 10, 10-ish million, seed would be 10-ish million, would be, it's a lot cheaper than that. And, and, and both of you guys are writing checks and what's the range of check size you should write? For us, it's uh, for the seed, it's uh, one to three million. Okay. For for the Series A, it's maybe four to ten million. Got it. Yeah, our check size is typically two to three million. Okay, all right. So we talk about valuation, how much you invest. Let's talk about exit, and after that, I'm going to open up for Q and A, and we're going to end our conversation with sort of prediction for Hong Kong exit. So 2021 is everybody talk about spec, and it looks like this whole spec bubble is pretty much over. So what do you guys think in terms of the theme for exit for 2023? Is there any, is there any light at the end of the tunnel for, for IPO and whatnot? What, what, what do you think? Well, we never did any SPAC. We never uh, created any SPAC. We never, uh, we never uh, well, we had one exit that was through a SPAC and that, that's it. So we always thought that was prone to um, uh, problems. So I think that's okay. It doesn't affect us. Uh, I, we are reliant on various IPOs to drive the most of the returns because all of our funds, they're usually returned by less than 10% of the portfolio through IPOs. The rest, there's M&A, there's different kinds of things, but they're very small in the grand scheme of things. So for the IPOs, we're fortunate. We still have potentially U.S. IPO open. U.S.-China negotiations are hopefully making good progress. Hong Kong remains to be the, the main target for us. And then we still have the China uh, Shenzhen market, A shares, as well as the star market and the Beijing Stock Exchange. So all of these are uh, suitable for different types of companies. So now it's really more choices than ever. And also the currency used to be a problem. In China, you used to have to pick RMB path or US dollar path. Now there's more flexibility to change 
should the market conditions change. So theoretically, there are more choices. In practice, of course, some of the markets have not enough volume. Other markets, you know, it's hard to get an investment bank to decide to underwrite. So we still have to uh, overcome the fundamental issues. But the number of markets, I think there are lots of them. So I, I've been a big skeptic of um, specs deals from the start. Um, and it's for a very obvious reason. I ran a public company for 44 quarters, so 44 tough quarters. And when you're not ready to go public, you know, which is basically now everything is disclosed, every detail. Now every 90 days you have to make earnings. You make, make predictions every 90 days and every year. When you're not ready, you're not ready. There's no way to cheat around this process. So I, I never thought that was a smart thing to do in the first place. So without a doubt, I think 23 for US company, tech company, we're not going to see many IPOs at all. And the hurdle rate is going to be super, super high. And you better make your number for six, eight quarters out. So I think we're not going to see a whole lot of that, given the economy is going to be jittery to try to predict that far. So with that in mind, I think exit will likely come from, um, which is cyclical, a bunch of M&A activities. We saw recently Cooper Software was um, sold for $8 billion, which is only 8.4 times for 12 months revenue. So it's very cheap. And it was a public company before it's taken private at that kind of prices. So this gives a lot of pressure to private company to be able to sell to public companies because they have to make the deal creative almost instantly. So that means that more pressure to late stage deal if those are to be you know, absorbed into public company through M&A but we're gonna see a lot of activities. So I was telling the story about the year 2000, year 2001. So the company I ran, BEA Systems, actually took that opportunity because two events happened, which is uh, basically kind of a war and then a bubble bursting. When that reset it, a lot of company went away. We took advantage and went from a very important piece of system software and expanded it into the platform. Like, I almost spent my whole life trying to kill IBM. And that was our opportunity because that was it. I stomped on it literally during that time and took advantage and bought um, companies and let ourselves get into spaces that we would be very difficult organically to try to get into. What you would likely see in M&A would be the following. Because the most expensive thing to build in a public company, which is the most risky, is channel. Once your channel is set, anything that channels and logistic is worth buying it if you can make it a crypto very quickly. So I will watch for those kind of deals. And if you think you need to exit your company, that will be the way to exit it out is to be making the, your company acquirable into those kind of scenarios, which is a crypto very quickly for the buyer and it's an adjustment to its channel. All right, so to, to summarize, uh, I guess, 2023 will be a year of M&A, but if you do want to go IPO, as you know, Dr. Kaifoli was saying, there's many, many options, especially if you're Asian companies, you don't necessarily have to go to the US to go public. Um, and it sounds like 2023 will make 2022 kind of sleepy year if you are into AI. And even though valuation is pretty bad, as long as you have year and a half, two years of runway, you will survive. So that's sort of a summary of what we uh, talked about today.